Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Good evening to everyone. Good evening. So it's my pleasure that we, you know, we are having this uh, evening uh, commemorating the memories of Dr. Ismail Raji al Faruqi. I think you may be familiar with him or not, but I will give a bit of introduction. And uh, uh, first, I'm really thankful to the IIIT. Uh, you may be familiar with IIIT, the International Institute of Islamic Thought at Harden. Uh, keeping this uh, legacy of al Faruqi at the uh, uh, American Academy of Religion. As you know, Faruqi was the founder of Islamic Studies uh, unit at the uh, American Academy of Religion. And I used to come with him uh, in 76, you know, he was regular to be part of that. And I, as a student, always to be with him, coming to the American Academy of Religion to be part of the Islamic study. So that's his legacy. And uh, thanks to Triple IT keeping that legacy of Al Faruqi. If you may, a little bit background of Al Faruqi that, uh, you may have read some of his books, but a scholar of great eminence, Al Faruqi was. He had in depth, uh, I mean, as a visionary, he had in depth knowledge of Islamic thought as well as Western thought. So, in his personality, he was both, in other words, he was encyclopedic, if I use the word, of Western philosophy, especially Christianity. And uh, Abrahamic religion, but Christianity and Judaism uh, and Islam. So you can see uh, his uh, uh, different uh, writings in this way. So, you know, if you look into his life, uh, the way he spent his time, and especially his life at Miguel, uh, where he was, I think, uh, in postdoctoral study, going in depth into Western philosophy. I think if you if you have read his book Christian Ethics, a real and uh, I mean a scholarship that you can see how Christian ethics is, and that's why the dean of uh, the uh, dean of the uh, uh, McGill University once wrote about Al Faruqi, that Al Faruqi is a person of two words. East and West. Intellectually, he is at ease, at ease with both, but not in peace with both. And that, you know, and especially when I look into the, his Christian ethics or Western scholarship, I think if Al Faruqi had stayed with Western scholarship, he would have created a new school of thought. I think if you see this Christian ethics and some of his other writings, even Aruba in religion, uh, his earlier writing and then Christian ethics, he would have certainly created uh, a new school of thought uh, uh, <clears throat> in Western philosophy. But you know, as Cross said about him, he was not in ease with both. So how he, that change which you see in his life, uh, which we call it from Aruba to universalism, uh, to universal thought, uh, another universality and Islamic studies, shifting to uh, totally towards Islamic studies, giving his life to Islamic thought. And that's what you see. The rest of his writing is mostly um, about Islamic studies and things like that. So that when I mean, you see that his life and how he was devoted to Islamic studies, he was quite a bit uh, about the Muslim world and the things that we, the way Muslims uh, things were happening in the Muslim world. Uh, he used very, which I still remember the words he would use uh, most often that the Muslim world have lost their identity, their intellectual vision. So Farooqi put all his efforts um, to make sure that the young Muslims especially we as his students, others, would get that new identity of new vision of Islamic knowledge. And so that's what you see, Islamization of knowledge that he 
um, pushed for it. And so he and some of his colleagues, I don't want to mention his name, but I happened to meet with all of his colleagues uh, who used to meet uh, in the 70s and then early 80s talking about Islamization of knowledge. He was the one and his friends, along with his uh, uh, a group of friends, that they started with Islamization of knowledge by creating Islamic universities. They thought that this will bridge the gap between the Western knowledge and between uh, the traditional Islamic knowledge. So how to bring this together and to give a new identity to Muslim youth when they graduate from uh, Islamic universities. So that is that started in 18, 1982. Though, different Islamic universities were created in different parts of the world. Triple IT, the discussion about Triple IT started in 1980s. In 1981, they were able, uh, Alpha Ruki and his friends were able uh, to put the foundation of the International Institute of Islamic Thought at heard in Virginia. So all this, you can see this vision was for young scholars that they will come together, whether they are Muslims or not Muslims, whether they are in the social sciences or whether they are in religious studies, they will come together and that triple IT will be their place to discuss openly the uh, Western scholarship and Islamic uh, traditional knowledge and come up with uh, ways and means to see what are some of the drawbacks of the Western knowledge and what are some of the drawbacks of the Muslim traditional knowledge and how to do the Islamization of knowledge in a true sense. So that was the vision. And that vision uh, is carried today by Triple IT. And I just give you an idea, Triple IT, International Institute of Islamic Thought, main office is in Hardin, Virginia, but it has offices throughout the world. So it's not only in Virginia, it's in Africa. I happen to go to see some of them. I happen to go in Niger to the Islamic University when I was giving lectures in different places. And different countries, you can see uh, triple IT offices and I as well as Islamic universities. So that is something that I would invite you to please, if you are not in contact with triple IT, please do so. And we have they have the Summer Institute for Scholars where they will give you the hospitality of staying and some, they will support you if you would like to, um, you know, to be, uh, to enroll yourself in, uh, in the uh, uh, summer, uh, uh, summer program for the scholars. Uh, so that's uh, about al Faruqi rahimahullah. You know, personally, I had been very close to him. That was my first, uh, when uh, a book which I wrote about him in early 90s, and it was published also, uh, the way I saw al Faruqi and his vision. Uh, so it's my tribute to him. Uh, and it's available at Triple IT as well as other places. Now we will come to our um, speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Walid Al Ansari, uh, for today's. Uh, uh, evening discussion, presentation. Uh, you know, his topic is uh, uh, the is there any Islamic economics? So he will be talking about what is real Islamic economics? Uh, and he will be presenting his own vision about that. Uh, you know, um, uh, Dr. Walid Al Ansari is the uh, Hilal Hisham and Layla Idris Al Savedi University Chair in Islamic studies in Chuvet um, University, where he teaches courses on comparative Islamic, comparative religion, Islamic studies, and religion and science. That's quite a bit of variety. Good. He holds a PhD in Islamic and religious studies from George Washington University and MA in economics uh, from the University of Maryland. His research focuses on the intersection of religion, science, and economics. So that's a very good background that you had uh, 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 expertise in both areas. Uh, he has authored numerous publications, including 
Islamic environmental economics and the three dimensions of Islam and his, uh, his co-edit volume, Muslims and Christian Understanding, Theory and Application of a Common World. Uh, other recently public, uh, published articles include uh, Can Our Science and Economics Honor Nature? Another one is Hindu and Islamic Economics and the Need for a New Economic Paradigm. And also uh, has another other books and articles that he has published. So not to take uh, much uh, time, I want to invite him to talk to us about the topic, what is real Islamic economics? Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dr. Shafiq. Um, it's really an honor to be here uh, uh, delivering the uh, Dr. Ismail Farooqi Memorial Lecture. Uh, he was a man of great principle and sincerity, and his involvement in politics led him to espouse Arab nationalism, as you all may know, but it obviously was never of a secular bent. It was deeply religious, and he was interested in Islamicizing uh, the social sciences and economics, obviously, is one of them, uh, but the discipline has not fared very well. Uh, leading Muslim economists lament the current state of the discipline. And there was a recent article in uh, Aegis by uh, Dr. Ah um, Ahmed Akbar Susmato that carefully documents uh, the dissatisfaction with the current state of the field. He points out that, dis quote, despite the thousands of conference papers, journal articles, book chapters, and monographs circulated or published so far, efforts to develop Islamic economics do not seem to have brought about the expected results. And Asad Zeman, uh, another leading uh, scholar in the field, writes that despite some partial successes, quote, it would be fair to assess the overall outcome of these efforts to establish Islamic economics as a discipline as a failure, unquote. For Muhammad Aslam Hanif, Islamic economics does, quote, not seem to be moving forward. According to Munzer Kaf, the discipline is still, quote, a mission unaccomplished, unquote. Mohammed Akram Khan ar argues that Islamic econom economists have been, quote, unable to break any new ground, unquote. And regardless of their claims, quote, the end product is not significantly different from mainstream economics. Masood Alam Chowdhury laments that, quote, present day Islamic economics is in a dire state. It is not original. It is failing to be delivered or derived from the teachings of the Quran, Sunnah, or Islamic scholastic thought, unquote. In an earlier work, he commented that, quote, Islamic economics has become a total slave of mainstream economic theories and is no different from the neoclassical approach to ethical behavior, unquote. Even Omar Chapra admits that, quote, the theoretical core of Islamic economics has been unable to get out of the straitjacket of conventional economics. He also accepts, unquote, he also accepts Sayyid Vali Reza Nasr's argument that the discipline of Islamic economics has, quote, failed to escape the centripetal pull of Western economic thought and has, in many regards, been caught in the intellectual web of the very system it set out to replace, unquote. There's even lack of clarity of what, on what makes economics Islamic. Now, several scholars have tried to explain why efforts to develop Islamic economics have fallen short of expectations. Uh, Islamic economists such as Siddiqui, who recently passed away, Allah Hamu, uh, highlight the lack of research funding for Islamic economics. Others highlight the historical youth of the current discipline, which is still in its infancy. But as Susmato points out, quote, it is true that research funding and maturity matter. Nevertheless, the slow development of Islamic economics has more to do with substantive methodological issues than technical ones. In fact, despite the touted lack of research funding, the scholarly literature, the liter the scholarly literature mentioning the English terms Islamic and economics has increased from 6,670 in 1976 to 1985 to 205,000 in texts in 2006 to 2015, and from 547 texts mentioning the phrase Islamic economics in the earlier period to 13,000 in the later one, 
and the latter one, uh, according to Google Scholar. This increase in textual mentions clearly indicates a substantive growth in research, unquote. So it's, it's, uh, there's been a tremendous growth in the literature, but the main obstacle, in my opinion, has been a focus on Islamic economic law, uh, which sets the outward conditions for work in an Islamic economy, rather than the Islamic wisdom tradition dealing with the spiritual significance of production processes, which have enormous implications for exchange processes and patterns of consumption. Now, as we all know, the doctrine of Tawhid, which asserts the unity of God, as well as integrating all things around him, establishes a hierarchy of spiritual and other needs in Islamic economic activity. Islam envisages religion as not just a part of life, but as the whole of it. It incorporates what one does, makes, thinks, and feels, sanctifying the whole of life in addition to answering questions of man's origin and return. What would appear to be the most mundane of activities has religious significance, integrating all of life around a sacred center. From this point of view, work is not only supposed to help us keep us alive, but is also supposed to help us strive towards perfection in fulfilling a hierarchy of spiritual and other needs. If work could not fulfill such a hierarchy of needs, one would have to face the awkward question of why the creator would oblige men and women to follow a course of physical action that seems to prevent them from fulfilling their deepest spiritual needs. Did God make some kind of ghastly error in making our survival dependent upon pursuing the opposite of what is necessary to attain happiness, peace, and the highest aspirations of our nature? If not, we must conclude that work must somehow support us in attaining those aspirations rather than prevent us from realizing them by engaging in degrading work that is beneath our human dignity. Accordingly, we can derive three purposes of human work as E.F. Schumacher, who was greatly influenced by Muslim scholars, suggests. The first objective of work is to provide useful and necessary goods and services. Second, to enable every one of us to use and thereby perfect our gifts like good stewards. Third, to do so in service to and cooperation with others so as to liberate ourselves from our egocentricity. Now, of course, economists recognize the first objective of work to provide necessary and useful goods and services. But some recognize the other objectives to various degrees, acknowledging that different types of work have different effects. So, for example, Adam Smith acknowledged the second objective of work to some extent, arguing that an extremely high division of labor employing few of our faculties could have serious social costs by reducing certain human capabilities. He states, the understandings of the greater part of men are necessarily formed by their ordinary employments. The man whose life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. But in every improved and civilized society, this is the state into which the laboring poor, that is, the great body of the people, must necessarily fall, unless government takes some pains to prevent it. Now, there were other figures such as James Mill, the father of John Stuart Mill, who opposed this view, denying the existence of such harmful effects and arguing that all types of work were homogeneous in terms of the second objective. He also denied that the third objective was possible based on psychological hedonism, leaving only the first objective applicable to economics. Now, I believe that Muslim economists have thus far failed to clear the ground of three errors related to the three objectives of work, explaining why the discipline of Islamic economics has stagnated. The first is the erroneous claim that industrial production processes and exchange processes fulfill all three objectives of work and are inherently compatible with a variety of ultimate ends, whether egoist or altruist. If such a claim were true, the Islamic sciences of man and nature would have nothing to say about modern production processes, 
despite the fact that they are products of a radically different philosophy of science. One must also clear the ground of the erroneous claim that sacrificing the second and third objectives in favor of increasing the first objective is both sustainable and worthwhile. If either of these claims were true, there would be no need to change current economic direction. Thirdly, one must clear the ground of the erroneous claim that neoclassical economics provides a theory of choice that accommodates all three objectives of work along with any other internally consistent values or tastes. In that case, the Islamic sciences would have nothing to say about the analytical tools of neoclassical theory, which is mainstream economic theory, despite the fact that they were imported from Newtonian mechanics and 19th century physics, with all this implies for the economic analysis of law, major aspects of economic policy, and the separation between ethics and economics that frustrate the three objectives. Now, unfortunately, Muslim economists fail to clear the ground of the first two errors, limiting their attention to Islamic economic law, which sets the outward conditions of work, but fails to engage the Islamic wisdom tradition for understanding the spiritual significance of nature, which has enormous implications for Islamic art and the making of things in the context of the second and third objectives of work. Muslim economists have also failed to adequately address the third error regarding the analytical tools of mainstream economic theory. So I would like to answer the question of what is real Islamic economics in three parts uh, dealing with the three errors. Um, I'm not going to be able to get through all of this in the short time we have, so I'll simply summarize the arguments uh, as follows and then try to go into as much detail as, as time allows. I'd like to begin by clarifying the intimate but currently neglected connection between traditional Islamic cosmological sciences and an Islamic theology of work. Here I'd like to examine the application of these principles to Islamic production processes and their implications for vocational occupations and exchange processes to fulfill all three objectives of work. According to the Islamic view, the natural world, ayatollah, reflects God's perfect names and qualities and manifests his blessings and bounties. The beauty, symbolism, and corporeal utility of nature thus fulfills a hierarchy of spiritual physical, and other human needs simultaneously. From this perspective, what man makes or man and women's art should communicate a spiritual truth and presence analogous to nature or God's art. Indeed, we are able to build, write poetry, paint, or compose music only because God is the grand architect of the universe, as well as the poet, capital P, the painter, capital P, and the musician, capital M. The arts and crafts have therefore never been regarded as different forms of activity in Islam. I would also like to discuss the Quranic approach to protecting the environment and make a few comments on Islamic agriculture. Uh, but as we shall see, economic activity in the Islamic world was always thickly embedded in spiritually significant non-market institutions. Accordingly, economic activity did not constitute a separate domain from the rest of social life, and there was no discipline of economics in the modern sense of the term despite tremendous economic activity. Now, this is in opposition to Adam Smith's and the conventional economic way of looking at modern society as, quote, made up of two spheres, an economic sphere of individual initiative and interaction governed by impersonal laws that assure a beneficent outcome by the pursuit of self-interest and the rest of social life, including political, religious, and moral interactions that require the conscience ba conscious balancing of self-interest with social considerations. This is some sometimes called the separate domain argument, since economic activity is a separate sphere of activity from the rest of social life. The enormous differences between Islamic and industrial production processes refutes this the first aforementioned error that both systems fulfill all three objectives of work. I would then like to apply these principles to critique industrial and post-industrial capitalism and communism, 
rejecting the second aforementioned error that sacrificing the second and third objectives of work in favor of the first objective is sustainable and worthwhile. And here we focus on what economists call negative externalities or negative side effects caused to an outside party in a business transaction. This would include pollution generated by industrial production processes. Now, such externalities lead to what is known as market failure, in which prices do not accurately reflect the full costs of production, leading to the depletion of environmental capital, as well as the overconsumption of underpriced consumer goods, all of which in turn leads to the environmental crises. So the beneficent invisible hand of the market, to use the term coined by Adam Smith, is converted into a maleficent, a maleficent invisible foot. Since the pursuit of self-interest leads to negative socioeconomic outcomes. Now, government, unfortunately, is often unable to correct such market failures in a timely manner because of special interest groups that profit from pollution and other negative externalities, contributing to politicians' election campaigns, thereby blocking leg legislation to correct market failures. The result is what can be called government failure that complements market failure. Policy reform to address the long-term environmental crisis is therefore too little, too late. The same applies to industrial communism with proper adjustments in the sense that special interests can take on even more corrupt and dysfunctional forms, since bureaucrats tend to confuse their own interests and the interests of their bureaucracy with the interests of society as a whole. Accordingly, industrial communism has an even more dismal environmental record than industrial capitalism. Moreover, proposed technological solutions to address the environmental crisis often depend on a non-holistic paradigm that fails to fully appreciate uh, the interconnectedness of nature leading to superficial technological solutions that often ultimately backfire and can even create worse problems. More thoughtful proposed technologies also generally arrive too little too late because these technologies are often too expensive relative to the artificially low prices of pollution generating technologies that special interests attempt to profit from as long as possible. Finally, it is important to note that special interest groups within industrial capitalism also contribute to economic instability in the shorter term because they promote legislation that distorts the distribution of income in their favor. We've seen this uh, since the late 1970s, productivity growth has more than doubled. Uh, some economists estimated that it's tripled even, whereas the uh, average income adjusted for inflation of workers has either stayed the same or flat. So obviously something's going on when you have productivity uh, rising so much and wages basically remaining unchanged or even declining. And so this leads to the possibility of a shortage in the demand for goods and services, since workers who suffer relatively lower incomes as a result of the skewed uh, income distribution can no longer afford to purchase what their households could in the past. And this can this shortfall can result in recessions. Turning to the third error, I would like to begin with a critique of the Coase theorem, the central insight of the most cited paper in economics by far since World War II, which maintains that defining property rights is sufficient to address the problem of negative externalities without the need for philosophical judgment to adjudicate between competing parties, all assuming that government failure does not occur. This therefore suggests a somewhat weaker form of the separate domain argument and analogous issues apply to government regulations based on cost benefit analysis. But the Coase theorem and cost benefit analysis erroneously assume the amount, that the amount of money people are willing to pay to stop pollution is equal to the amount of money people are willing to accept pollution when property rights are reversed. And although this assumption can accommodate the pre preferences of misers and hedonists, it cannot accommodate those who hold spiritual values regarding the environment. And it is precisely this assumption that is behind the primary analytical tool of neoclassical eco economics, which is called a mono-utility function, which reduces needs 
to wants and values to tastes by reducing everything to a single use value. In other words, all things are commensurable. There's no uh, the same use value that one gets from shoes and a knife and furniture are all just reducible to a single want. They're not qualitatively different. And so this challenges the neoclassical claim to offer a spiritually neutral theory of choice that could accommodate any set of internally consistent values or tastes. And because the mono-utility function basically works for only Myers and hedonists, it essentially smuggles psychological hedonism into economic policy while suppressing ethical debate over policy by claiming to be neutral. So this refutes the third aforementioned uh, error that a mono-utility function uh, supports the separate domain argument, particularly through the neoclassical economic analysis of law. And so we conclude that economic activity is neither a separate domain in an Islamic economy, since markets are thickly embedded in spiritually significant non-market institutions, nor in industrial capitalism, since market failures require legislation to correct, which is not forthcoming because of government failure. Beneficent outcomes necessary for the separate domain argument to apply are therefore lost to the invisible foot of the market. Attempts to uphold a weaker form of the separate domain argument by defining property rights simply smuggles psychological hedonism into economic policy through the back door. Finally, Islamic economic thought maintains that economic externalities resulting in market failures are ultimately ubiquitous, since there is a unicity or interrelatedness of, create, of creation that reflects the unity of the divine principle. Neoclassical economic theory views externalities as far less universal, since modern thought lacks the ontological doctrine of unity, tawhid. Fortunately, studies by ecologists over the last few decades are bringing to the fore the remarkable interconnectedness of nature, which implies the pervasiveness of externalities, which we hope will ultimately inform conventional economic theory. So that's a summary of the three main errors related to the three objectives of work that Muslim economists have failed to address. And that's why basically Islamic economics has essentially stagnated. Fine. So uh, we'll try to get into a little bit more detail uh, on this. And uh, the chapter of the B uh, in the Quran, more than any other chapter, emphasizes the beauty and wonder of the natural world as signs of God or Ayatollah, reflecting his names and qualities and fulfilling our spiritual needs while simultaneously pointing out its material benefits as fulfilling our corporeal needs. So, for example, verses five to seven state, and cattle has he created for you, in which there is warmth and other uses, and whereof you eat, and in them there is beauty for you, when you bring them home and when you take them out to pasture, and they bear your burdens to a land you would never reach, save through great hardship to yourselves. Truly, your Lord is kind, merciful. And so here, the idea of jamal, beauty, is invoked in addition to their practical uh, uses. The same applies to horses and other riding animals in the next verse, which describes them as adornment, in addition to highlighting the many other essential services they render to us. The Quranic emphasis on the beauty of nature is conveying signs, quote, for people who understand and who reflect clearly demonstrates that nature reveals a spiritual truth and presence from the Islamic point of view. Subsequent verses express similar principles regarding a hierarchy of spiritual and other needs in different contexts, such as the sea, streams, and stars, which are dazzling in beauty while making it possible for human beings to seek God's bounty by acquiring, acquiring goods through distant trade by land or sea. The rational response to such bounties is gratitude, shukr, which in turn results in contentment and fulfillment. From this perspective, the cosmos itself is there to be read as if, as if it were a boundless book revealing multifaceted meanings and purpose placed therein by its author. It is the relation between the cosmos, the Quran, 
and humankind that is central in Islam. In a sense, it can be said that there are two Qur'ans, the written Qur'an, Al-Qur'an al-Tadwini, and the cosmic Qur'an, Qur'an al-Takwini, the second of which speak to us in ayat or the signs and symbols that abound throughout the natural world. The Qur'an itself refers to these signs in the verse, we shall so show them our portents upon the horizon, afaq, and within themselves, and fusihim, until it be manifest to them that it is the truth. The words and letters of the Qur'an, the elements of the macrocosmic creation surrounding us, and the microcosmic world within us, that is, our faculties of intelligence and of the heart, all these signs and symbols exist that we may perceive within them the divine message they reveal. Titus Burkhardt explains the interconnections between art, beauty, and work as follows. God is beautiful, and he loves beauty. Allahu jamilun yuhibbu jamal. This saying of the prophet opens up limited list, limitless perspectives, not only for the inner life, where the beauty loved by God is above all that of the soul, but also for art, whose real purpose, understood in light of this prophetic teaching, is to support the contemplation of God. For beauty is God's radiance in the universe, and every beautiful work is a reflection of it. According to another saying from the prophet, God provide, prescribes perfection in everything. The word ihsan, which we translate as perfection, also has the meanings of beauty and virtue. It is thus a duty of the Muslim to seek perfection in every work. This perfection implying beauty in its turn. The traditional practice of the arts refers to this maxim, and one will immediately understand that on this basis, there could be no schism between craftsmanship and art. Thus, the production process is conceived as a spiritual discipline in which what one makes is not only a means of livelihood, but also a product of devotion. As Kumara Swami asserts, every man is a special kind of artist in this perspective. The artist is not a special kind of man. Therefore, or furthermore, it can be said that there is a necessary connection between beauty and spiritual realization in work. Beauty has its source in the ultimate reality, capital U, capital R, and as, as such, it radiates throughout all levels of existence. As human beings, we find an inner resonance with beauty, for it reminds us of our celestial origin, that origin whose memory we carry deep within our being and in which we recognize our true nature. By reading the signs and symbols, the ayatollah throughout creation, we gain in spiritual wisdom, ultimately realizing our potential as beings made in God's image or sifat. This approach to the making of things has always been closely wed to the spiritual practices of Islam because the necessary condition for this approach is consciousness of one's mortality and complete dependence upon the absolute or spiritual poverty, fakr. Significant spiritual preparation involving prayers, meditation, and spiritual contemplation were an integral part of the creative process for traditional Muslim craftsmen and craftswomen, at the end of which a beautiful design would emerge, combining utility with spiritual truth and presence. Purity of soul and nobility of character were obviously indispensable for such works. While it reflects principial knowledge and grace, traditional Islamic art can be functional and fulfill the spiritual material needs of both maker and user in its interweaving of beauty and utility. Living traditional civilizations generate art at all levels, including the utilitarian, in the knowledge that to create something for people's use is ultimately to create that object for God since each person is capable of being God's vicegerent on earth. The aesthetic aspect of work is fundamentally linked to the ethical product, production of products. In traditional civilizations, high quality and beautiful products reflected the love the maker had for his or her work and the fact that its production filled not only a practical need, but a spiritual one. 
The product made with such awareness enhanced the life of its owner through its beauty and significance as a manifestation of devoted artistry. One need only think of the harmonious patterns and colors of a Persian carpet to understand that its makers put much more than the goal of economic gain into the its production elevated the soul of both maker and user. I'll just conclude with the following quote from Titus Burkhardt. Uh, he says, I knew a comb maker who worked in the street of his guild. He was called Abdulaziz, the slave of the Almighty, and always wore a black jalaba, the loose hooded garment with sleeves, and a white turban with a lithem, the face veil, which surrounded his somewhat severe features. He obtained the horn for his, for his combs from ox skulls, which he bought from butchers. He dried the horn skulls at a rented place, removed the horns, opened them lengthwise, and straightened them over a fire, a procedure that had to be done with the greatest care, lest they should break. From this raw material, he cut combs and turned boxes for antimony, used as an eye decoration, on a simple lathe. This he did by manipulating with his left hand a bow which wrapped round a spindle caused the apparatus to rotate. In his right hand, he held the knife and with his foot, he pushed against the counterweight. As he worked, he would sing Quranic surahs in a humming tone. I learned that as a result of an eye disease, which is common in Africa, he was already half blind. And that in view of long practice, he was able to feel his work rather than see it. One day he complained to me that the importation of plastic combs was diminishing his business. He, he said, quote, it is not only a pity that today solely on account of price, poor quality combs from a factory are being preferred to much more durable horn combs, he said. It is also senseless that people should stand by a machine and mindlessly repeat the same movement while an old craft like mine falls into oblivion. My work may seem crude to you, but it harbors a subtle meaning which cannot be explained in words. I myself acquired it only after many long years. And even if I wanted to, I could not automatically pass it on to my son if he himself did not wish to acquire it. And I think he would rather take up another occupation. This craft can be traced back from apprentice to master until one reaches our Lord Seth, the son of Adam. It was he who first taught it to men and what a prophet brings, for Seth was a prophet, must clearly have a special purpose, both outwardly and inwardly. I gradually came to understand that there is nothing fortuitous about this craft, that each movement and each procedure is the bearer of an element of wisdom. But not everyone can understand this. But even if one does not know this, it is still stupid and reprehensible to rob men of the inheritance of prophets and to put them in front of a machine where day in and day out, they must perform a meaningless task. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Walid Al-Ansari for this beautiful talk. In fact, I learned a few things. I'm not a student of uh, economics, but uh, at least uh, pinpointing the shortcomings of a Muslim economist, very beautifully the way you did it. And also I learned a new terminology in the Tawhidi paradigm, which Muslim intellectuals will always talk about it, that there is no secular, no tradition, but under Tawhidi paradigm, uh, how all reflect to the same. So I, along with the Tawhidi paradigm, which you mentioned, I like the additional word of Jamal, which I never saw that they have used it. Maybe it's my, uh, but it's, I think it's very beautifully the way you brought the Tawhidi paradigm to it. I think if al Faruqi was alive, he would have liked, and I quote uh, Dr. Walid Al-Ansari, he would have clipped a lot to hearing these words of Al-Ansari. The modern words, ecological crisis and socioeconomic disequilibrium result from the reductionist, uh, mechanistic, and materialistic uh, worldview that desacralizes work 
and does injustice to men uh, and threatens nature, I mean, does injustice to humanity and threatens, and threatens nature by treating both as resources rather than the sacred uh, creation that they are. I think that's the real problem. That's the real problem of today also. Uh, how we see is that we are treating nature and around, things around it as resources and how destruction has happened. So that the Hidi paradigm and bringing Jamal into it is not only the solution to econo ec economic prob uh, problem of economy or economic issues. Uh, also, these are there in social sciences uh, and other areas of knowledge also. So I really thank you for that by bringing it. Uh, and I think the Muslim econ economists should know what are really the shortcomings because they are really emphasizing at the law, uh, you know, which many of them who are there and who are very famous in Islamic economics. So let's have some chat together, some uh, things that you would like um, uh, to talk about it, uh, some QA a little bit. We still have a little time. So I want you to participate. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, please. Um, I was wondering, you referred a couple of times to how um, the way that the monastic uh, maybe uh, the field of Islamic economy has been borrowing or focusing a lot on the legal aspects and not so much on the wisdom of it. And as someone who works in the field of Islamic law, that makes me think, what a shame <laughs> that those two are separate categories, right? Um, so I guess I, I want to ask you to reflect a bit on how maybe even that in and of itself is a crisis, the fact that this legal tradition is so disconnected from some of these principles of Western work. Yes. yes, thank you for that wonderful question. On um, Yes, yes, I'll rephrase it regarding the disconnect or the separation these days between Islamic law on one hand and the wisdom tradition on the other. And, you know, this, this is really a modern phenomenon. And it's, uh, it's uh, in the traditional Islamic world, the legal scholars were also aware of these, of the wisdom tradition itself. I was talking with uh, Sheikh Ali Guma, the former Grand Mufti of Egypt, who was discussing the traditional curriculum at Al-Azhar uh, in, in earlier times, in which the scholars really received a very holistic education uh, in which they knew uh, law on one hand, but they knew the intellectual sciences and the wisdom tradition on the other. Uh, and unfortunately, as a result of uh, the kind of compartmentalization of knowledge that we see today in the West and the secularization of knowledge, things have become fragmented. And therefore, uh, we no longer have that traditional holistic framework uh, for scholars to learn. A few are able still to integrate these different fields. So for example, Sheikh Ali Guma is a scholar of law on one hand uh, for the dimension of Islam, if we talk about that in terms of right action in the Sharia. On the other hand, he's also a scholar of theology and philosophy, uh, dealing with the dimension of Imam. And then he's also a Sufi sheikh, uh, dealing with the uh, inner purification of both, uh, of both dimensions of Islam and Iman. Uh, and so we have uh, some figures within the Islamic world who are able to really integrate all three dimensions of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And of course, Imam al-Ghazali in the past is a great example of that, who would, who would um, be a figure um, that would uh, be able to uh, accomplish this. 
Uh, so there are some other scholars within the Islamic world, like Abdullah bin Bayah and others, who also integrate these three dimensions in, in a single person. So they, these scholars are out there. It's not totally lost, but unfortunately, it's been moved to the periphery rather than being at the center. And hopefully, uh, we'd like to reverse that and bring it to the center where it really belongs. But thank you for that wonderful question. Thank you very much. Next question. Also, I forgot to tell you there are some books from IIIT. So when you leave, please pick up a book that you would like to. Um, any next question? Let's uh, have some discussion. I appreciate the distinction you made um, uh, between the focus on the formal legal uh, approach of uh, Muslim economies, as well as uh, the Muslim tradition. And I think uh, in the broader Islam Muslim communities, that is also part of the failure, quote unquote, uh, of uh, Muslims bringing Islam into the modern context right? <laughs> by focusing on the legal formal expression of Islam. Now, um, you refer that as one of the cause of the failure of the development of Islamic economics. And so I was, I was wondering, um, based on your emphasis on the wisdom tradition with the emphasis on this uh, unitary vision of the of the universe uh, between the spiritual and the mundane. Um, I was wondering if what we traditionally conceive as uh, the conventional economics, uh, if we fix some of the elements that forget the unitary nature of the economy, um, can we make that as Islamic economic without saying it, it is econo Islamic economic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Why do we focus on the name of Islamic economics <laughs> if if you if you don't if you want to separate between the legal formal manifestation of uh, Islamic economics and go to the wisdom tradition? Isn't it the wisdom tradition that uh, said that? Well, the name is important, you know. Yes. No, that's a very good question regarding. Um, do we need to call it Islamic economics if it's really reflecting a kind of universal wisdom that exists in other uh, religious traditions as well? And um, and that's that's true. You could call it traditional economics uh, uh, rather than Islamic economics. Uh, tradition in the sense not of uh, man-made conventions, but uh, being drawing from a revelation from the inner dimension of oh yes thank you from the inner dimension of revelation and then applying that to different domains uh, and so in that sense it's it's very use, uh, universal you know E F Schumacher who is probably the most important economist from this perspective of the last century who was greatly influenced by Muslim uh, thinkers, intellectuals, uh, such as René Guénon, uh, Martin Links, and, and so forth, um, had, wrote a very famous essay called Buddhist Economics, in which he also laid out these three objectives of work and talked about uh, fulfilling a hierarchy of spiritual and other needs in a Buddhist context. And in the chapter preceding that, he said, you know, I could have written this from any point of view, any religious point of view. I could have written it from uh, Jewish, uh, Christian, Islamic, Hindu, or some other religious perspective. But he chose uh, Buddhism uh, as uh, for, the, for that purpose. And somebody asked him, why didn't you write on Christian economics? Because he was a Christian himself. At first, he was an, uh, um, an atheist and then became agnostic. And then after reading some of these Muslim scholars' works, really developed a very profound appreciation for the Christian intellectual tradition. So it's very interesting how Muslim intellectuals uh, contributed to that. 
but in any case, when he was asked why he didn't write something on Christian economics, he said, well, then nobody would have read it. <laughs> so he, he wrote it on Buddhist economics. But it's very interesting. You know, the, before Schumacher died, actually, uh, he was scheduled to have a meeting, meet with Sayyid Hussein Nas, who uh, arranged uh, for meetings between Schumacher and other leading intellectuals and uh, cultural figures in Iran. Uh, but unfortunately, Schumacher died uh, shortly before the meeting was scheduled to take place. But uh, Dr. Nasr had uh, many of Schumacher's works translated into Persian. And so that's why to this day, Schumacher is more known in Iran than any other part of the Islamic world. And so this uh, speaks to the universality uh, of, uh, of, of these principles that, that you pointed out. Correct. But Al Faruqi would like that we use the word Islamic because oh. identity is very significant. Yes, yes. I mean, and also it differentiates between the traditional economics and the issues which are there, traditional, which I brought it, you know, which I wrote everything about that. So that is something, you know, that uh, uh, that nature has been taken as a resource. It's God's gift and how it should be used from the spiritual perspective. So I think al Faruqi would have been very serious on this issue to say this is what is the difference between Western economic theory and Islamic economics, meaning that the Hidi paradigm and now we have the word Jamal how to bring that to it. Yes. To make it in the service of humanity. Yes. It, 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 each, each one of these uh, traditions needs to draw from a revelation. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether it's going to be Hindu economics drawing from the Vedas or uh, Islamic economics drawing from the Quran, it, it needs to be rooted in a revelation to bring out that inner dimension. To, to the religious tradition. So on the one hand, it is universal in concept, but because it has to be rooted in a revelation, uh, it becomes particular in application or manifestation. Yeah, let's, let's have a little more and then we will go uh, conclude it. So anybody else wants to? Yes, please come closer. No, I, I'm fine. I just want to make a comment. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you very much for the Excellent presentation. Uh, my comment is uh, in support of what you started with, for example, about uh, the Islamic economics that is that looks like it is in its infancy or it has not been successful. And so that team you started with that, and I have this idea, I think the reason, one of the reasons is that there is no support for that as an agenda. For example, I know you just tell, told us the, and your understanding of what Islam economic is. So that means you have clear idea about it. Now, what is lacking or maybe lacking or what we needed to make it bear fruit was to have a, an, an institution behind you with all the support you need, give you five years, 10 years, unlimited years to continue doing research and not only the research, but to, to apply it so that we will see when it will end and the outcome that it, we will see. If there is this kind of financial support without limit of time dedicated to you, and then you have your colleagues, other colleagues, you have your students, all of you are in this, uh, getting this support, carrying it on. I'm sure when Dr. Faruqi started uh, and he and his friends started this reply, if this, what I'm suggesting, 
was to happen. By now, we would have seen a lot of achieve people who have achieved and have carried on their ideas into fruition. Yes. So what in the uh, 40 years or 50 years now? Mm -hmm. So if that is nothing, that is where we have Islamic economics not bearing fruits. Right. Otherwise, there's no enough support that we needed in order to wait for a long time in order to get the result. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can just bring the example of uh, medieval Beitul Hikma. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. idea, there was a cloud, financial cloud, and political cloud behind. And we all know what the result has become in terms of Islamic civilization, what they had produced. So if that kind of idea was there, and I guess I'm just happy to use you as an example, if there would be some organization or some people who would give you unlimited support and let you continue to apply this and, and see what would come to the result, that would have been something. Right. Thank you for that. Oh, yes. From from your lips to Allah's ears, <laughs> so we'll pray for that kind of uh, institutional support that can really help generate the results. I think the first step, though, is uh, and what I'm trying to do now is just to establish theoretical clarity, and um, and then when it comes to the applications of those principles will be in much uh, better shape once we have the theoretical vision uh, worked out. But yes, uh, really, if we had started this, you know, 40 years ago, we'd be in a much different place. Right. Thank you. You know, th that that's very true. The, uh, <clears throat> the way Islamic civilization happened during the Abbasid period was the uh, political and economic power behind it, Betul Hikmah, where everybody was there, and how they started to, uh, and that's why we call it the golden period of Islam, both the period in uh, Spain and Israel is uh, uh, in Baghdad, the two big uh, uh, areas which you see how that revived the whole knowledge and the things which we, so the problem today is that Muslim governments in different countries are reluctant to give support to this new idea of uh, Islamization of knowledge. So that's something I think you can see throughout what, uh, where the, uh, the Malays continue in Muslim countries and how they are suffering. So the other thing is that, uh, just to mention, if you look into triple IT, the, uh, books which they are producing. For example, in law, not only the fiqh al quite a few books, um, Muslim living in minority, because these books were never written before, because Muslim never lived in minority before. They were always the ruling elites. Now living in minority, living in non-Muslim majority countries, that's a big contribution. Not only that, an asul al-fiqh, they have produced quite a bit. So on the Quranic methodology, on the Hadith. So they are trying actually to produce literature for the next generation. And the next generation may get a vision out of it, how to bring a positive change. In other words, how they can devote their lives to the Tawhidi paradigm. And with Jamal, because Tawhidi paradigm with Jamal will restore that beauty which we see during the golden period of Islam. Uh, so that's what I think uh, these efforts which al Faruqi and his friends, uh, may Allah bless them, those who have died uh, and those who are still working. So it's amazing work which is happening here and other places where the triple IT offices are there. So that work is there, which is happening. 
Thank you. Uh, so I think with that, any any other question? Otherwise, we can conclude. With thanks to our speaker, Unwar Idar Ansari. I just have one additional one additional comment. That's so great. We want to keep you here. <laughs> no, I want to. It's a beautiful well. evening, by the way. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I just wanted to make one additional comment uh, in the context of, of uh, your points regarding IIIT and the remarkable efforts that uh, Dr. Farooqi um, initiated. Um, <clears throat> and this is just a, a, a very uh, mild uh, criticism, just in the for the sake of the truth. But I think... Uh, Dr. Faruqi, I, I know he's in heaven now, so he would, I think he would, uh, would agree with this. Uh, Dr. Faruqi uh, was against the teaching of Sufism yeah. in the Islamic world, but he was not against the teaching of Sufism here in the United States. And the reason he was against the teaching of Sufism uh, in the Islamic world was, was because he thought it was uh, would create a kind of passive uh, uh, mindset uh, that would not be able to counter the you know the onslaught that was coming from the West politically and and so forth and um, that has a significant drawback because one cannot really understand the economics, traditional Islamic economics, as we discussed tonight, without understanding Sufism and how the different guilds were actually organized often along uh, issues along principles of spiritual initiation and so forth, and the symbolism, and penetrating both the world outside, but also penetrating ourselves inside for spiritual realization. All of these things cannot be understood without Islamic mysticism. Mm -hmm. And so this is one element that's really crucial that um, Dr. Farooq Dilar Hamu uh, kind of pushed uh, to the periphery. And I think it's really essential that uh, Triple IT going forward brings Sufism front and center for issues such as Islamic economics. Wait a minute. You know, I remember uh, 77. I said to Al-Faruqi, we need to bring good Sufis to America because this is too materialistic. People are sick of materialism. How about to have good Sufis here? She said, Shafi, please. <laughs> what is the Sufi? I mean, he has reservation, which I mentioned in the book, uh, in the concluding remarks about that. So anyway, uh, I mean, you know, if you were there at that time, uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasser and Al-Faruqi both were there. Said Hussein Nasser was there briefly at Temple, I think for a year or so, uh, and <laughs> very good debates between Said Hussein Nasser and Al Farooqi. Amazingly, you would be sitting there, and they would be uh, making this discussion over there. So it, those were good days, actually. Uh, so, anyway, so thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming this evening to hear about uh, Islamic economics and to pay respects to al Faruqi and his memory. And in fact, al Faruqi and his wife, we shall also pay tribute to his wife, Lami al Faruqi. Actually, Lami al Faruqi, uh, if she was not there, Faruqi would not have achieved what he achieved. So in other words, how together, this was a team of what they did. Along with that, I need to mention Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. Uh, Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, was at Pennsylvania University. He was one of those people who, Jamal Barzanji, may Allah bless all of them, and Tahir Jaber al Alwani. These were the pioneers in this work. And some of them are alive now, but these four of them are in the heaven. 
and our prayers are for them. So thank you very much, people who did good work. And I hope this young generation of yours will continue with this work, what our uh, predecessors have established for us. Thank you all. I hope to see you sometime at IIIT and around. Thank you.